All right, here we go, day two of MixCon 2017. How's everyone doing? Our sponsor for Rich Chicky's session is Plugin Alliance, which distributes BrainWorks. All our sponsors are the reason that MixCon is free to attend. So thank you, Plugin Alliance and BrainWorks, for bringing us Rich today. What we've got right now is a mixer that I'm really thrilled to have. He gives us an international contingent because Rich Chicky is all the way from Toronto, Ontario. R Rich, thanks for crossing the border and uh, making it down. Rich has worked with Rush, Dream Theater, Aerosmith, Skillet, Pink. He's got a lot of credits and he's really gonna bring it for the progressive mix. So get your math hat on. The song he's going to play is super exciting. It's got, uh, it's by artist Zach Zanin. The drummer on here is Mike Mangini from Dream Theater. It's it's a high energy track, so this will give you your jolt. Let's let's go, Rich. Should we start? Perfect. Should I How's shut up? Yeah, yeah, let's do it, man. Yeah, let's do it. Cool. How's everybody doing tonight? All right. So what I want to do today is uh, this, this track I'm going to play for you is an uh, artist named Zach Zalen. Zach is a multi-instrumentalist uh, from California. And he called me uh, last year. Uh, he was a cold call and he said, hey, I'm a big uh, Russian dream theater fan. And uh, you'll hear some of the influence of uh, that sort of thing uh, in, this, in this music. And he wanted to do a, uh, a thematic progressive album. And uh, it's an instrumental record. And uh, so what I want to do is I want to play the song for you. And there's uh, quite, a few, quite a few elements. I mean, it's Mike Mangini, so you could see just by this, there's, all right, that's, that's the drum kit alone, right? So there's lots of stuff going on. Uh, so I'll play this through, and uh, then I'm just going to start stripping through the, uh, strip the mix down. And if there's any questions or anything, then uh, we'll proceed through and get them answered for you, okay? So let's listen through to the track. That wakes you up a bit. All right, so this is a grand total of two people. It's uh, Mike, Mike Mangini and this artist, Zach Zalen, that's playing everything else. So uh, one of the things that I want to point out is uh, I'm trying to make this sound in some ways is modern, yet it has, there's classic uh, elements from, from a, a, a mixing and production point of view. There's some classic elements involved. But this is something that's recorded under very modern conditions in that uh, there's no real amplification. I, I'm a strong amp user, and just because of the way uh, the artist works, we didn't use this. Uh, this is all amp simulators, right? Everything's amp simulators, so everything in here, aside from the drums, right? Uh, when, when I was approached, Zach had programmed all the drums, and um, we had discussed how to work around this, and he said, oh, I'm a big fan of Mike Mangini's, blah, 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 blah. So I contacted Mike about uh, recording this, and then we went over to Dave Grohl's uh, studio, uh, 606, and uh, the Sound City console that you may have seen, um, the Sound City console that you may have seen in his, uh, what's that called, something highways? Thank you. So he, uh, th that's the console that we use. So we recorded drums at, uh, at um, at the Foo studio, right? And then we took it all back. And this is uh, this all, all mixed. By the way, this is, this is mixed on this exact rig. OK, so I just brought the rig with me. This is, so it's not, uh, it's entirely possible to do um, 
very large scale work now in an incredibly small footprint. Okay? Now, when I, I come from, uh, from an analog background, I, I mixed on SSL consoles for, uh, for decades, and what I, one of the things for me to maintain my workflow is um, I built up sessions so that uh, the routing is actually very console-like, very analog in its approach. And so what I want to do is I just want to show you, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll start sort of far back and we'll get in and and microscope a few things as we get in, uh, uh, get in closer. So what I end up doing is with a kit like say with Mangini's kit, I end up subgrouping a lot of things down so it becomes manageable at mix time because right now, um, if you look, I've got uh, three different types of uh, samples. Now I don't want to say it's, it's not a sampley record but with, uh, with Mike, there's, you can see that I've laid in like a, a metal sounding kick drum along with his kicks. And then there's uh, uh, three different, I use one, two, three, four different uh, snare channels when I'm recording. And Mike has a total, uh, this is his quote unquote smaller kit. So he has a, uh, uh, for this he has a total of four octos and five toms. So he's got, he's got nine toms as opposed to his usual uh, 12, right? So uh, I end up subgrouping, plus he's, if you zooming down here, you can see this hat, rides, spots. Uh, I, I end up putting these into subgroups, which you can see here, right? So these are everything with the smaller S, oops, excuse me, everything with the smaller S beside it. I, uh, I use these as my subgroups. So when I get to a mixed stage and say I like the way the kick uh, the balance is for the kick or snares or toms, then I, I will generally leave the individual channels alone and work with these subgroups. Okay? I also have, uh, I also have uh, reverbs that are any sort of ambiences. I keep those in as opposed to having them uh, at the end of the console, which is what I used to do in an analog se uh, con uh, setting. I'll end up putting them here right in with the drum kit, and then I've got a, anything where you see here, anything marked here where it says V, this is hard to do when it's there. All right, these are VCAs. In, in, in Pro Tools, I end up using VCAs so that uh, I can emulate the center section of the console, right? So this, this will allow me just to globally turn the drums up and down as I, uh, and this also is good for gain structuring because if you keep moving stuff around, all of a sudden you might find you're running out of headroom, right? And when you run out of headroom in a, in a digital setting, generally it doesn't sound so good, so I try to avoid that. Okay? Uh, I do the same thing with bass, with guitars. I end up subgrouping and subgrouping, right? And then I have the effects sitting beside. Now, when you, I go further down here, This is where I have all my VCA set up. So uh, you can see this is, there's some things here that aren't relevant to this session that are still left over from the template that I started with. Uh, but I've got uh, anywhere here, I've got my kit, bass, uh, acoustic guitar. There isn't any in this song, but there's uh, other songs. Uh, the guitars, the solos, and then these keys. Everything is grouped into these VCA. So I can globally change this as I go along. And then finally, I have this final this one called gain crisis that as you work through things, if, you, if I start to run out of gain, I can actually just go in, turn down the entire mix, and everything stays nice and balanced, right? So I, I don't drive my, uh, my stereo, mix, uh, my stereo bi mix bus too hard. Not that I don't drive it hard, I don't drive it too hard. Okay, let's look at a few of the, uh, let's look at a few of the, uh, the channels. I'm gonna start with the kit.
Now, Mangini's kit, he, he, has a lot, he has a lot of metal in his playing, but it's got a lot of metal. It's got a lot of cymbals, a lot of, lot of wild things going on. And I want to show you a couple of, uh, a couple of tricks that I've been using to sort of get things, uh, get things tamed down. In a console setting, one second. One of the um, one of the things that I've taken to doing is uh, I've been using uh, a few different console style plugins that uh, that emulate. Uh, in my case, because I'm a strong SSL mixer, that emulate uh, uh, SSL consoles. This is a this is one of the uh, new plugins from uh, from Brainworks. And this is the console E, and this is re reminiscent of the old uh, SSL E console, which is the console, out of all the ones that I've used, this, this, was, this was my preferred console to, uh, to mix on in the, uh, in the analog domain, okay? <clears throat> so this has, if you're familiar with the console, it, it's very similar in structure to the analog console in that uh, it has the EQ, the dynamic section, you can, and the, the routing within the, uh, uh, within the the plugin itself is is pretty intense. Okay, so it, it, there's a lot of lot of versatility here. It allows you to uh, it allows you to get the same sort of drive and power that you get from an analog console. And one of the things I want to point out is this technology here. Uh, when you select uh, when you instantiate uh, the, this uh, plugin on a channel, what ends up happening is this number will change. This number here will change. This, this, the console, this is not a replication of one channel. This is a replication of the entire console. So literally, this is, this is an emulation of channel 46 from a specific console. And I would have to ask Dirk which console it's from. You see, I would just change to 45, 46, 47. So you can literally have all the little variations that are inherent in the analog domain, you can have that within this plugin. And that's actually one of the things that the effect is cumulative. So in a session like this, where I have 50, 60, or 70 channels, and if I were to use this plugin on every channel, it's not the same as having 70 channels of a single plugin. This is like having 70 channels of different plugins because they're all very slightly different, right? So what I've noticed is I would go through and pick, uh, pick combinations, which literally would be like you would pull a patch on a, on a console and then move it to the other channels and see which ones sound better. So it's, it's a pretty incredible step forward in, uh, in the uh, emulating technology. Now, one of the uh, other things I wanted to show, I don't use I don't use just that one um, uh, plugin. There's, there's also this one. This is the uh, Universal Audio plugin. Uh, one of the advantages of the Universal Audio plugin um, is that well, this can be used with their console technology. So this can be used for tracking in real time, okay? Under the assumption that you're using a native system. If you're using a native system, this can be really great for tracking with, without any latency. All right, and this is what I'm using. Uh, this is what I'm using on the uh, my metal kick. Okay. So you can see if I if I start to just look at some of the plugins within the uh, within the kit. I mean, there's this is literally just having the console itself. Phase is incredibly important to get the low end, low end uh, uh, punch and drive. So you can see, I, once in a while, I will use the, uh, I'll use Little Labs, uh, the IBP, which will take phase and move it in between zero and 180. So it's different than just pressing the, the button on the console. This allows you to actually slide the phase around. So in this case, I'll take the, uh, I'll take this uh, and put it on, uh, it, right now it's on the, uh, FET 47 that was on the kick drum, which is a little further out 
than the, uh, than the ATM25 I was using in the kick, right? So you, you get a bit of phase variance, and what it'll do is it'll adjust the FET47 so that the, the uh, waveforms are completely aligned on top of each other. All right? Now, looking at this, um, I mean, Mike's, Mike's kit, he's got great... He's got great sound, so I end up adding... Uh, end up adding... You know, the, it's not... Any, any kick samples do not replace... Nothing is replacing the kit, it just adds to it. Okay, and that's something that I, I really want to make as an important point. And rather than trying to EQ tons, because of the genre, there's usually a lot of high end on the kick. And rather than, um, uh, rather than having wax and wax of 10K and then start to have trouble with cymbals and all sorts of uh, strange things, especially where you've got the, uh, the kick air, which is a uh, 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 microphone that's outside of the kick drum. So if you start to add tons and tons of high end, you're going to end up having trouble with cymbals. So I also add this. And that's just a bright little tiny transient that sits at the beginning of the kick drum, right? So if I want to have the attack, especially when Mike does stuff, we just brr -da -da, brr -da -da, something where it's really fast, just add in just a little bit of it. Too, too much makes it doesn't sound right. But adding just a little bit of it gives you that, the transients, but it, so we can hear it, we perceive the transients, even though he's hitting a bit lighter. So instead of saying, hey, wow, my kick drum has disappeared, right, we can compensate ever so slightly with the transients. Does that make sense so far? All right, let me try something else here for you. Now, again, looking at, uh, you're going to see, you're going to see quite a few uh, these uh, plugins showing up. Now, if you're watching the way the uh, uh, plugins are, you sp keep an eye up here, especially uh, for this particular plugin, because this this is the filtering. And one of the things that's really important is to, if there are frequencies that are not being used, so to speak, for me, uh, for my mixing style, I clean them out so that there is no buildup essentially of sonic garbage. So, you know, if, if you go back, let me just go back to the kick for a second, give you a better example of what I'm talking about. Okay, and this down here now, you can see it's set lower. I'll move to this guy, maybe. Okay, so we're sitting, and these are, these are adjusted really by ear, so don't, don't let the, uh, the, the numbers aren't really etched in stone. If you're familiar with using an SSL, it literally was something where you would go by feel, by how much uh, sub-information that you wanted to have in, the, uh, in, in your audio source, okay? But you can see here we're doing some roll-off, some roll-off of the really, really high frequencies, and then taking out some of the really subsonic garbage that's going to actually detract from the power of your mix, okay? If we move to here, you can see that the... Uh, the high pass filter right here has moved up. You see that? It's moved up slightly because we're not gonna have the frequencies that are in the kick drum in our snare. All right? Now here, look at these two guys here. So our snare. This is another uh, this is another uh, uh, Brainworks Plugin Alliance. Uh, this is a form of a saturator. I don't know if anyone's used the analog version of the, the black box, but this is a really fantastic uh, emulation of the black box. And what it does is adds harmonics. If you push it too hard, it adds, it'll, it will distort, but it adds harmonics. It com it, it adds a form of compression, right? It's a form of compression because it's saturating, but it doesn't sound like a formal compressor, okay? And it emulates two different types of tube styles. So I use, the, I use a little bit of this on the snare drum for this particular mix, and then I also have a copy of my main snare, 
right? And this, this one here that, that, that I'm, I have highlighted, this one is really crushed quite hard, okay? So uh, what I do with this is, it's essentially a form of parallel compression where the, uh, the one that's marked snare, uh, snare 57 up here, this one is more or less not processed and the one below it is heavily processed and I blend the two together. Okay, so it's not one or the other. Um, this, uh, this neat little uh, uh, plugin right here, I use this, uh, if you're compressing the snare a lot, a lot of the times you get the hi-hat level comes way up. And if you, uh, if you just gate it, right, you'll start to get that pssst, you'll really sort of hear this, this cutoff. Now, in order to minimize that, not necessarily eliminate it, but to minimize it, what I've done is uh, I use a multiband uh, unit from FabFilter. Generally, it's often used as a compressor. In this case, I'm using it as an expander. So what I have right now is I have a frequency uh, selective uh, expander, right? And it will take the high end down very quickly off the snare. So you get the transient fully bright, and then it shuts down. But you don't lose the body of the snare because it's not like a gate. It doesn't cut off all the signal. So the snare still resonates, but we tame the high end. Okay? Now, the other thing that I end up doing, if you look at this, there's a setting here where you go from, uh, from band into into free, what this allows you to do is this allows you to adjust the frequency of the detector because you want, you want, to, have, uh, you want to have the frequencies limited to the root resonance of the snare because if it's left wide open, this thing will start to activate with the hi-hat. We don't want that. Make sense? Yes? Okay. Of course, you've seen this guy a lot. Now, you take a look here quickly, you can see a lot, lot of the low end is rolled off here. See, because we're trying to get sort of character and note out of the snare. I don't want woof out of the snare. So you can see I've taken a lot off and I've taken a lot of the extra high end off the snare, again, to tame the, uh, tame the um, sibilance from the, uh, from the hi-hats, okay? Use this guy a little bit to add Sustain, again, that's to extract the note from the snare, and this is blended in with the original snare. Okay. This is adding body to the snare. And finally, here's the last trick. When you, when you end up compressing the snare, it's uh, a lot of times when you have that, uh, it, it almost gets to be almost like a reverb, in that it's got this ah, right? That's, that goes when you end up compressing it uh, pretty hard. Uh, one of the other Brainworks plugins that is really, uh, for me, this is a real workhorse to, uh, to add width to instruments. This will, this will allow you to take the snare, and I can actually make the snare very wide in the sound field, just the, uh, just the compressed part of it. So when we're hearing, it's, this is set up very much so it's almost like a reverb, right, where you have the the, the initial hit is in the center, and then the, the compressed part of it is very wide, and it goes in, across the entire stereo field. Okay? And again, you could see right here, there's not a lot of it applied. So if you put too much on, all of a sudden it's like, wow, this doesn't work, it sounds very strange. But with it, very little, it becomes very, very wide in the mix. Um, I also used, uh, for, for this, I also used a, uh, uh, KM84 on the snare, I, I taped them both together, so I had a 57 and a KM84 together. Uh, you can see here, compressed, black box, you start to see as a bit of a pattern. Right. Same thing, transient designer for some extra whack. Okay, don't have to flip the face on the uh, snare bottom because I had done that when I was tracking it. But if I was getting this as a mix-in, that'd be one of the first things I would check, that if it was tracked, I'd want the, uh, 
the, the face to be correct for the bottom and top snare. Uh, for, the, for the toms, I have these toms all subgrouped uh, down into the, uh, uh, the tom subgroup that I showed you before. So just taking a quick look at, uh, I'm just going to show you one of the toms because they're, they're all set up, aside from the frequency differences, they're all, they're all set up really the same. So you can start to see this is showing up a lot. This takes the, the symbols out of things like the uh, octaves. Mike, when Mike is playing, he has his octaves right up here. So he's, all of his uh, octaves are in the same uh, physical area as his china symbols and stuff. So it's important to keep control of the, uh, uh, of the high end. Okay, so in this case, I'm using a, uh, I'm using a multiband to compress the, uh, uh, the toms. And again, this is showing up here. The, uh, uh, the BX uh, plugin is figuring prominently on the drums. Uh, I also use this <coughs> to add just a little bit of extra, a little bit of extra bite and bark to the toms. Okay, I use the decapitator, just, to, just a touch of uh, more or less of analog saturation. Right? And to fine tune levels, I just have a uh, trim plugin. So those are all subgrouped and panned. Uh, one of the other things, let me just show you briefly. If all the toms were left open, uh, if all the toms were left open, they would be going crazy. We would hear them ringing and doing all, all sorts of stuff. So rather than getting uh, Mangini to mute his drums, you know, with tape and all sorts of things that, that generally will detract from the tone, uh, I had my assistant go through and I have him do uh, physical uh, rides. Right, you see that? So he's, he, I have him do rides for me on all the toms. And uh, I, I typically use about 15 to 20 dB, again, so that the toms don't disappear entirely, but the, they're just turned down to clean up. Rather than using a, uh, a gate or an expander, I don't like the chattering that you get, you know, when the kit is shaking or if he hits a, a, a drum adjacent and you know you'll get the something that opens and then the symbols you know so there's like a, a cascading effect of things that can happen so what having somebody do this once it opens when the drum is hit and then there is no there's no second guessing all right let's move through Hi-hat's pretty simple, very little boosting. Actually, in, in this case, no boosting going on, just cutting. Get rid of trouble frequencies, get rid of harshness up around here, around 2.5, 3K, right? And this isn't, this isn't being used right now, this, this band, but it literally is cutting out stuff that we don't need. Spots. These are uh, uh, these are. Oh, I missed the ride. I'm sorry. Let me go over to this guy here. Ride symbol. Again, you could see we're cutting off a lot. A lot of use of uh, filtering to get rid of uh, low end garbage that we're not going to need. Right. This is incredibly small on the screen here. Sorry about this. Okay. And just getting rid of uh, getting rid of sort of the box. Some of the boxiness that you can get out of ride symbols. Okay. Slight bit of compression, and this is a this this plugin here. This is a deesser, and if you look here, this is a parallel deesser, right? It's running running in parallel. And what I end up doing with this is uh, listening to what the root frequency is of the bell, and it all depends on the drummer and how the drummer hits. And if the drummer happens to hit kind of really side sticky, and the and the, and the high, uh, I'm sorry, the ride symbol can get harsh sounding. What this will do is this stays out of the way until, you know, if, if he's playing something and all of a sudden he'll do like a complete side hit and rather than, you know, it flying out of the mix, this thing will just grab it up, right? So it just smoothens out the, uh, uh, the ride work a bit. Spots, these are uh, all of the, ch the smaller, Chinas and all the, the smaller elements that Mangini has, they're set on the outside of his uh, drum kit, probably equivalent in height to roughly his, uh, his shoulders. 
and this this adds all the little elements that uh, that he's hitting. So again, it's just very very slight compression, cleaning up the bottom end, right? Taking out some of the uh, uh, problem frequencies in the uh, in the um, uh, mid range. Now you you can see there's not a lot of boost going on with the symbol. Rather than boosting the high end on the symbols, have more of a tendency to cut away stuff that's that that would affect the tone and leave the high end intact. Because they're usually plenty bright. Okay, same thing. You can see there's a pattern going on as far as overhead, slightly different tailoring of the bottom end. Right? Room mics. Room mics, I use uh, uh, SSL style, SSL style plugin. You can see here, fair chunk of uh, uh, compression uh, going on but it's not, it's not really crazy. So with, uh, uh, I may do something in, in SSL, it was called backbussing, where it, it's a form of parallel compression. In this, in this case, I didn't use that. I just opted to have, have the, uh, the kit smoothened out in the room and to bring out the character of the room a bit more. Okay. Okay, moving to here, these are, these are the subgroups of the drums. So we've gone through all that stuff. I'm sorry it's taken forever, but we've gone through all, all of the kit. I have to speed this up, we're gonna run out of time. I have a, a limiter that will go when Mike is uh, doing his kick work. So when he's coming out, if there's anything that he's uh, going to come out and transient is a little excessive, this is what's gonna pick it up. This is, this, this is generally doing nothing it's more of a safety net, okay? So it, when I'm setting this up, I'll, I'll go through and I'll go, okay, here's, here's what his nominal level is. Here's what his nominal level is, and I'll back it down so that it's not, it's not going to do a whole bunch of uh, uh, limiting to the kick. Snare, just some fine tuning with the EQ and, uh, and limiting so that it pops. Toms, adding body globally. This, Adding EQ to each individual drum is a little bit different. This, this has a little bit of a different feel where I just want, I want all the uh, toms to have uh, the same EQ brought on them so that they feel consistent throughout the kit. So if they feel more glued together, so I have the one EQ that I end up using. And again, not a lot, it's fine tuning. Same thing with this thing, not a lot going on. A little more high pass going on. Very, very slight boost very, very slight boost in the top end on cymbals here, globally, okay? And same thing here. All right. And we could see here the console, a lot of console plug-in going on. Uh, low, low end of the room is being rolled off, right, and just adjusting some level here. For drum room, let's uh, just quick look at some ambiences. Uh, I have a, uh, this is a, uh, the Relab uh, 480. I used the Lex 480 for a long time, so it's one of those things that uh, uh, I wanted to hold on to when I mix in the box. Um, I wasn't convinced for a long time, I wasn't convinced that anybody had done a really uh, good job with a 480 uh, emulation, so I had my assistant, I, I gave him a one sample tick, and I had him more or less sample a 480 with just the tick, and we ran the same tick through, uh, through this plugin, right? And ended up just A-Bing and making a few parameter changes so that I, I couldn't tell. So it was remarkably close uh, emulation. Another snare ambience, not used in this song, but this is, like I said, this is a template, so I, I have a, uh, uh, I have a uh, fairly short plate that's, um, oh, sorry about that, pull that over, EQ'd slightly. I also have a, what I call a, a tile, tiled room. This is a preset that I wrote for the uh, uh, Waves H reverb. So this is, uh, if I want to have the, it, it, the closest thing I would say in the analog world is I think it's tiled room that's in the PCM70, and I would say this is the closest uh, 
this is a, a pretty good copy of it. I spent quite a bit of time with it. So, and that, that is available that's on, in the Waves package if you, if you want to check it out. Okay, moving in quickly to base. Uh, I was not afforded the option uh, I, I, when I did this, um, uh, when, when I mixed this, the artist had recorded bass and he had done it through a Kemper, so I didn't have a DI to work with, so what I ended up doing is I, I wanted to have that feel of two different sounds uh, that are stacked on top of each other to get that, that size. So, one second. So, end up adding a fair chunk of sub, and again, because I didn't have much, uh, I didn't have any control over what was recorded, in this case, I end up using this, uh, I end up using the C6 to even out the bass, uh, especially when you go from the E to the A string, right, he was using a, he was using a four string, uh, it was a precision, but, you know, you have that feeling of if you're playing an open A string versus the fifth fret on the E, you know, you get this level and tonality change, and I try to even it out with the uh, uh, with the C with the C6, and a uh, bit of an EQ, adding some of the uh, the Getty Lee bite that I I tend to like, and uh, here adding some some subs and a bit of drive, but not being overtly uh, distorted because that's not the type of tone that we were uh, that we were looking for. Again, this uh, I have this set up to. Um, keep the bottom end consistent. So it's substantial, but it's under control. Okay, here's another little, uh, another little trick I end up doing. You could see this, the, this is a fairly nice, wide, gentle uh, EQ, except right here, you can see there's a little notch. Now what I do is, I have that notch sitting in there and it's very, very skinny. You see the Q here is at 10 and it's very skinny and it's tuned to the kick drum. Right, and what I do there is I notch out a little spot so that I can just put the kick right in there so that you don't have the power struggle between the bass and the kick. Right, and that's that guy, one second. All right. This is uh, something that's, just, again, adding more low-end info to the, uh, to the bass. Let's quickly move on to guitars. These are all these are all uh, Kemper. Uh, these are all Kemper copies of. I think it's the JP uh, JP two C, and I think a two C plus. Right. So, uh, Zach is uh, he's a pretty huge uh, Dream Theater fan. So you know we went for the sort of the Mesa tone. You can see here this uh, this is showing itself up again. You can look again, cleaning out frequencies that we kind of don't need, which is the super high end, the super, super low end, right? But still adding bo bottom end here. Now, one of the things I also do is uh, to, get the, uh, to get the guitar under control, uh, when you're just doing palm mutes, you know, you also you get this, this woof that'll, that'll come out, and the woof sounds awesome and sounds really powerful, but to get it under control, I've set up a, a multiband and set it so that it again stays out of the way until there's a mute and then it'll take effect to control it not to eliminate it just to control it
and it's going to be doing more uh, depending on which, uh, which guitar we have it on, right? But that keeps the guitar sounding even, with you, so you can have tons of low end. You're not, you don't have to shave low end off because the palm mutes have, have too much. It allows you to have an, a, a nice substantial amount of bottom end the whole time on the guitar. Okay? Uh, Pultec EQ, something that I've always loved on guitar. In the submix of them. This is just a fine, fine tuning of the EQ. And again, this just picks up any little rogue things that jump out. Uh, we don't need that. One second. Okay, let's move to some of the, uh, some of the solos. Uh, what I ended up doing for the solos is, uh, this is something where I, I felt it needed a, a, little more, um, a little more saturation and glue in the uh, solo sounds when I got them in. So I ended up adding uh, the, the Studer uh, 800. And you could see here, I have a tendency to run it on the slower side, right, to really give it the, uh, right, where is it, right there. Right, I run it on the slower side. To, uh, to shave off sort of that, the high, uh, super high end that's in any of the, uh, any of the guitar sounds. Get it more, get a little bit more authentic. I gotta speed this up a bit. So again, rolling off super lows, super highs. You know, bit of compressing. And this is doing, uh, this is doing the same thing, taking off. If there's any uh, transients that he's doing, if he's doing any muted uh, runs, it's uh, rather than going through and automating the EQ, so if he's starting a run, he's going from very low to very high, and it's something that's palm muted, this will, this will pick it up, this will pick it up so it's nice and even. Okay, a little bit of a uh, compressor at the very, very tail of the solo. Uh, a few quickly, some of the uh, effects Good old, good old Avid Delay on some of this. Uh, one of the main uh, uh, guitar plates is from Nimbus. Very, very little, very little of it's added in, just enough so it doesn't sound uh, like it's a DI recording. All right, it's just a little bit to move it out, give it some space and not, not be overwhelming. EQing that, so EQing the, uh, the rev just a touch. Uh, this is a uh, this is a long throw uh, that I have of just effects. Again, it's not used in the song, but it's like a for tail end of solos. If the if the uh, player just uh, is holding a note and you know you fade it out, sometimes that can feel a little unnatural. So this is something that kind of carries a solo over. Uh, main guitar echo in this case is uh, a sound toys, the Echo Boy, and uh, those folks are out there. It's made uh, nice and wide using their. Uh, uh, their micro shift program, right? And then I, I have a tendency uh, to gate off some of the, uh, some of the uh, delays so that I can get enough repeats so that they, they can feel sub substantial when they're decaying, but then you're not left with like a little bit of garbage that we really don't hear, but it just muddies the mix. So it kind of is decaying, 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 and then okay, that's enough. So that's what I use. So you don't hear this working, Actively in the mix, but use it. I use it to keep it clean. Okay, you can see here. There's a subgroup here. So all uh, Zach records his solos in pieces. So there it is. Uh, there's his uh, solo subgroup. Again, let's look at this. That's using the uh, uh, the SSL uh, UAD. Uh, keys. Not a lot going on with the keys. This is just no no rules with this. this. Is something just changing the tonality of the keyboards. Uh, when we did uh, when we did uh, when we did organ, which I don't know where it is right now. One second. Might be hidden. One sec. There it is. The old right in front of me trick. 
all of the organ that we uh, recorded, um, again, all synthesizers, what I ended up doing is uh, I had, uh, w when I started mixing this, I brought a, uh, a Leslie into the studio and we took all of the uh, synthesizer keyboards and ran it out to a Leslie and I mic'd it and brought it back in. And then ended up, this is what the chain is quickly. You can see again, cleaning out garbage, right? Adding some mid-range cut to the, uh, to the organ so we can hear it in, in amongst all of the guitars. Uh, a little bit of a tape emulator from Slate on this, right? Limiting a bit and then adding a touch of, uh, a touch of rev. Overall, there's not a lot of uh, effects being processed on this, so I, I have a tendency just to drop the plugins in on the channels for smaller situations like this. If this was something where, you know, I had 12 channels of backgrounds and all that sort of thing, that I'd be using a more of a typical console situation, where I would have like a send out to a, 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 a an effect and then bringing it back. All right. So quickly, let's just go to the. Uh, Let's go to the uh, stereo uh, area. Uh, in, in here I have, you can see this is from my template, I have a few uh, uh, revs that are set up, including this one, this is a, uh, this is a new one that's been uh, pretty neat. This is a new one, this is a company that's done a Bricasti emulation called Liquid Sonics, and this one's been really great. So that's, uh, I use that a little bit in here. Um, I do have the uh, Eventide. This is set up for a, uh, excuse me, a harmonizing effect. Again, not using it in this particular track, but I figure I'll show you. Dimension D, this is globally set up for widening if I need it. Uh, going here to, uh, to the master, uh, I end up using, this is the plugin that I started, that started my whole relationship with, uh, uh, with Brainworks uh, many years ago. And I use this, as, I've been using this as my, uh, stereo bus compressor, uh, bus EQ, I'm sorry, for, uh, for years. <clears throat> so what I end up doing is I do my final little bit of sculpting. Uh, you can see that, uh, again, I wanted to, I, I, I do want this to have an, an analog feel to it. So you can see the stuff that's way up, this is in the 30K region. It's a very gentle slope down that, that you would get from using an, an analog, uh, uh, in an analog environment. They're just rolling off some super low frequencies that, that we don't really need. But you can see there's not really a lot of EQ going on on the stereo bus. Um, the final uh, thing that I have on the uh, stereo bus is, is uh, the latest version of uh, UA's uh, SSL bus compressor. Uh, so quickly, what, what I end up doing here is, you can see I, I end up using the, uh, the side chain so that <clears throat> Excuse me. The uh, the low end from the, from the kick and from the bass doesn't overly trigger the bus compressor. So you can see there's a bit going on here. There's a bit of the uncompressed signal that gets through here, in the mix control. And then for for my taste in 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 uh, mixing, I use the slowest uh, attack setting. I use that so I can get the most transients coming through. The faster this goes, the more it starts to shave off transients. Okay, it also glues the mix more, but it's at sacrifice of the drums cutting through. And again, I like this, uh, I have a very quick release time because I like the compressor to do its business and then get out of the way. Okay, so if we're playing it back, we can have a look and see what's going on. It's not a lot of compression going on. Okay. Um, I also have uh, I also have a few additional plugins. What I end up doing is I'll give my client uh, I'll give my client a uh, I'll send the unmastered unprocessed version to the mastering uh, house, and I'll give my client basically what my interpretation is of where this is going to be in its final setting. So is is it mastered? It's, it's, yes, it's almost mastered. So if they choose that they want to send it out, I'll send the reference copy and I'll send the unprocessed version. So here I've got a split 
then I have two different, I'll print two, two different mixes at the same time. Now, my version is that I'll add, this is again some fine tuning in the EQ stages. All right, some fine tuning in the EQ stages. This is not being used. I add a touch of this on the, the black box, again from Brainworks. You can see very low settings. Uh, very low setting, conservative settings, but this adds uh, just some ni really nice harmonics to the mix, okay? And then I use the, uh, uh, the I isotope uh, EQ. Again, this is just fine tuning a little bit. This is set in MS mode, so I can EQ. Uh, this is in the center only. So this affects the mono information only in this case. So what I wanna do in this case is add a touch of bottom end, a bit of mud taken out from where the kick is, and then this is a slight boost where the snare, the snare is, and the EQ for the guitar solos. So it doesn't affect the stuff on the outside of the mix. Make sense? All right. And a little bit of multiband, just if there's anything that pokes out, right, evens it out, you know, and finally I have a, uh, bit of a limiter, limiter that uh, takes it up so, so the, the mix is competitive to, I'll ask my client what they're listening to as far as uh, the type of music, who the artist is, you know, and I'll just do a bit of homework quickly. I'll, if, if their mixes are sitting at whatever level, then I'll make sure that we match it because if they're gonna compare, I don't want them to be comparing on volume, right? I want them to be comparing the mix face to face to whatever it is that they're, uh, that they're used to, whether it's a record company or whether it's the artist. Can we just say thank you to Rich? This was fantastic.